This conference will now be recorded. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Keely, you have the official distinction of um, officially maxing out the first ever Eco Foci seminar series um, with 151 people on the line. So, not to make you nervous or anything today. Um, so, we'll definitely be recording this as we run out of space, and both the DNI are getting a lot of pop ups. Um, for folks to join. Um, everyone's been really good about this. Just a reminder, please do not use your video cam and make sure your mic is muted during this time. Um, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 2020 Spring Eco Foci Seminar Series. Um, my name is Heather Tavasola. I'm the co-lead of the seminar with Jens Nielsen. And this seminar is part of NOAA's Eco Foci biannual series focused on the ecosystems of the North Pacific Ocean, Bering Sea, and U.S. Arctic to improve the understanding of ecosystem dynamics and application of that understanding to the management of living marine resources. The first eco foci seminar was held in October of 1986. So we've been doing this for a while. Um, and if you'd like more information on that, you can visit the eco foci webpage. As of right now, um, we have Keely today, and then we have one more um, seminar following in the series. And we will continue to run these virtually. Our speaker lineup can be found via the One NOAA Science Seminar Series and also the NOAA PMEL calendar of events. So again, just a reminder, just double check that those microphones are muted, that you're muted on the phone, um, that your video is off. And then during the chat, please feel free to type your questions in at any time. Both Jens and I will be monitoring the chat and we'll work with Keely at the end of the talk to answer those questions. So today, one of our newest members of the EcoFoci um, AFSC team is joining us, and that's Kelia Axler. Um, she'll be talking about her previous work on fine scale distributions, predator prey dynamics, and survival of fish larvae in a dynamic coastal river dominated ecosystem. Keely joined us in December. She obtained her BS from the University of Minnesota and just recently her master's from Oregon State University. She's worked not only in the Gulf of Mexico, the California current ecosystem, and now most recently the Chukchi Sea. She is part of the Ecofoci ichthyoplankton team, working to link ichthyoplankton dynamics to physical and fisheries oceanography, to verify larval fishes from all of our Alaska LMEs, and conduct field research with us as well. So Keely, just welcome to the team. I know this is your first introduction to the group, um, and we are so excited that you're going to be joining us today for seminar, and we really look forward to hearing from you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Heather. Can you hear me? Yes, you're good to go. Okay, great. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for calling in today. Um, so as Heather just said, I am a newish uh, fish biologist in the Eco Foci program at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. And today I will be talking a little bit about some of the research I completed for my master's work at Oregon State University prior to coming here. And then I'll move on to a couple of the new projects I am starting for the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. So the overarching theme of all of my past and present research has been to study how different physical processes and oceanographic conditions affect the early life stages of marine fishes. This is an important area to study because the survival of the planktonic stages is widely considered to be a bottleneck in recruitment success and is a period when fishes are highly sensitive to changes in their environment. For example, during the pelagic larval phase, most marine fishes experience extremely high rates of mortality with far reaching consequences for adult population dynamics. So failure, failure to find food and avoid predation and attain favorable transport can lead to high mortality, which can translate to low year class strength. So there's a tight link between survival of the larval stages and the surrounding oceanographic conditions that structure their spatial distributions and trophic interactions. So in the high latitudes of Alaska's large marine ecosystems, we're already seeing record sea surface temperatures and unprecedented sea ice loss. These ecosystems are experiencing climate impacts at much faster rates than other places, and it is therefore really critical to study the larval stages of fishes to be able to forecast how fisheries production will respond to rapidly changing ecosystem conditions. However, the impacts of climate change are not showing up elsewhere in the world nearly as rapidly as the Arctic. 
So for example, climate change projections for the mid-latitudes, like the Gulf of Mexico, are a little more variable and a little less certain as of now. But one impact that is already affecting Gulf of Mexico ecosystems, livelihoods, and fisheries is the increasing frequency of heavy rainfall storms, which is leading to record river flooding in the Midwest, and as a result, increased freshwater discharge into the Gulf. So this is a really big deal because as annual precipitation in the Midwest increases, all that rain and snowmelt makes its way down to the productive Gulf of Mexico ecosystem. The Mississippi River watershed is massive as shown here, and it entirely drains into the Northern Gulf, the results of which have been devastating for Gulf Coast communities and ecosystems. So for example, the Bonnie Carey Spillway is one of the river diversion structures in the Mississippi River that is used to divert very high flows into the Northern Gulf in an attempt to protect life and property in New Orleans. It has only been opened a little over a dozen times in its nearly 90 year history, but five of those times have been in the past decade. And this year, 2020, as they just reopened it last week, will be its third consecutive year being opened, which is unprecedented. In 2019, the diversions flushed trillions of gallons of nutrient-loaded fresh water into the saltwater Gulf of Mexico, reducing the Gulf salinity to dangerously low levels for sea creatures and decimating nearshore populations of fish, shrimp, oysters, and crab. Federal fisheries disasters were declared in Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana in the summer last year as a result of all this freshwater influx, and NOAA models forecast another year of widespread river flooding in 2020. So with the realization that these heavy rainfall events are increasing as a result of climate change, there is renewed interest in how high freshwater discharge events affect the early life stages of marine fishes and how that translates to fisheries production in the near shore. This satellite backscatter map shows the major sources of freshwater input into the northern gulf, most notably the Mississippi River to the west and Mobile Bay in the north. Both of these produce large nutrient-rich river plumes as shown here that extend far offshore into the gulf. So how does increased freshwater discharge affect the larval stages of marine fishes? As river discharge discharges into the coastal ocean, they emit a low salinity plume that emanates offshore. As plume waters discharge offshore, convergence with the surrounding coastal waters, as shown here, forms distinct frontal boundaries, both horizontally and vertically. These frontal regions are marked by sharp physical gradients and have been shown to greatly influence larval fish and zooplankton spatial distributions. Therefore, not only do they impact the physical coastal environment, but they also um, affect the biological coastal environment. So previous studies have shown that larval fishes in zooplankton concentrate in plume frontal zones in higher abundances than surrounding coastal waters through a combination of convergent physical processes and increased biological productivity. Aggregated prey resources in plume waters can have several important implications for larval fish population dynamics, as feeding success is a major determinant of larval fish survival, and aggregated prey resources should lead to increased foraging in plume waters. However, while plumes may concentrate prey resources and enhance feeding, the degree to which this translates to heightened survival remains under question, as the shallow frontal features that aggregate larval fishes and their prey also concentrate known larval fish predators, such as gelatinous zooplankton, whose buoyant bodies have a tendency to aggregate along plume frontal zones. So the objective of this study were to analyze the influence of high, high discharge river plumes on larval fish distributions and predator prey dynamics over fine spatial and temporal scales, and also to examine the impacts of plume encounter on larval fish growth and conditions. I also want to note that this study was done as part of my master's research at Oregon State and was part of a larger multi-institution consortium project that included many different collaborators at Oregon State University, the University of Southern Mississippi, the University of South Alabama, and others without whom this research would not have been possible. Also funding for this work was provided by the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. So our study region was Mobile Bay, a large brackish water estuary sourced by the Alabama and Tom Bigby River systems that contributes large nutrient-rich plumes tens of kilometers onto the shallow Alabama continental shelf. It's a model two-layer system where you have a fresher, turbid surface layer overlying a saltier marine layer with distinct differences in physical parameters between layers. It's a dominant year-round influence in the region and an important spawning and nursery habitat for many fishes, making it a really useful system to study how high discharge river plumes influence the spatial distributions and trophic interactions at the base of the marine food web. However, river plumes are highly dynamic in ephemeral features, which make them very difficult to study. 
Variations in river discharge, wind mixing, and tides and currents can alter the pattern of horizontal and vertical freshwater dispersal over very short time scales. This figure shows the rapid changes in surface salinity around the mouth of the Columbia River plume in Oregon through one tidal cycle. So you can see how it can be really difficult to study how these highly dynamic features affect larval fishes at sufficiently fine scales to resolve the underlying mechanisms. So to overcome this challenge, we used a variety of oceanographic equipment as part of a large scale collaborative field effort from April 8th through 11th in 2016. So to track the plume's location and movement, we used both satellite imagery and plume tracking drifters. And to characterize the different plume physical properties, we towed a chameleon microstructure profiler, did multiple CTD casts, and used shipboard ADCP to gather data such as turbulence, currents, salinity, temperature, depth, etc. And finally, to sample larval fish and zooplankton distributions, we towed an in situ plankton imager and did multiple um, net tows with a multi net system. So to examine the spatial patterns of larval fish and zooplankton around the Mobile Bay plume, we used a plankton imaging system called ISIS. While it's an unfortunate name, it's a really neat technology. This high resolution towed plankton imager collects real time shotograph images of larval fish and zooplankton while simultaneously sampling the in situ physical data such as location, depth, salinity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and fluorescence in the water column. Further, because it samples in a tight undulating fashion from surface to bottom, it allows fine scale horizontal and vertical spatial analyses across oceanographic features. Additionally, it samples very large volumes of water. For example, we towed for six consecutive hours per transect, enabling characterization of distributions and habitat use of taxa at much finer scales than traditional net samplers. It's also a really useful tool for quantifying gelatinous zooplankton that often break apart in net tows. However, it collects around two terabytes of data per sampling transect, which after multiple transects results in a pretty big data problem. To accommodate this, we used an automated computer algorithm to classify the different taxa. So image classification was done using an automated pipeline as shown here, which was created in collaboration with OSU's Center for Genome Research and Biocomputing. I'm not gonna go into great detail about it here, but to quickly explain this flowchart, you start with a raw image like on the upper left, which is then segmented to individual organisms. A training library is created to train the computer to classify images by shape using a sparse convolutional neural network, which automates classification. There are also multiple error checking steps along the pipeline, including a confusion matrix, which is used to quantify the error. The end result is that images are batched by organism group, type, and classification. So in total, after three roughly six hour long transects towing ISIS throughout the outflow of the Mobile Bay plume, we ended up with around six terabytes of data and 693 million individual organisms identified by the automated classification pipeline, which comprised 89 different groups of plankton. However, for ease of analysis and for the purposes of this study, only key taxa that were deemed to be ecologically important prey or predators of larval fishes were used in this study, and further, plankton were combined into higher taxonomic predator and prey categories. So the three different gelatinous predator categories that we focused on in this study were tenophores, hydromedusae, and siphonophores. I also want to note that only species that are known to be larval fish predators within these predator groups were included in our analyses. Calanoid copepods were chosen to represent the prey category because they are a rather ubiquitous prey group for many marine fish larvae in this region. And this category actually comprised of Acarcia, Centropages, Paracalanidae, and other unidentified calanoid copepod species. But to confirm their use as a prey category, we conducted a small diet analysis on larval striped anchovy and larval sand sea trout, which were the two most abundant larval fish species sampled during the study and confirm that calanoid copepods were major prey items for both species. So all larval fishes used in the analyses were manually verified by a human expert in order to assess the most common taxa, which were ingrolids, which are anchovies, cyanids, which are drums, and gobies. In rough, and we found them in roughly similar proportions um, in the ISIS imagery than the multi-net system for this region. So the in-situ images shown on this slide were taken during the plume study and show examples of different fish larvae, calanoid copepods, tenophores, hydromedusae, and siphonophores that we captured during this study period. So now that I've gone over the methods, um, first I'm going to walk you through the different environmental settings that we sampled on April 8th through 11th, 2016. 
So we towed the, in, the ISIS plankton imager, which is shown as the purple transect line on the map, and the chameleon microstructure profiler, which is shown as the black transect line on the map, across the Mobile Bay plume from west to east during a high river discharge event. For reference, the Mobile Bay plume has a daily average discharge of 2,200 cubic meters per second. In comparison, it was around 6,000 cubic meters per second when we sampled in April 2016. Additionally, the three sample transect time periods shown shaded in gray on the figure differed from each other by degree of wind forcing, which strongly modified the plume's location and structure. For example, on April 9th, the first day of sampling, you can see that wind was light and variable, but it increased slightly before our second transect on April 9th through 10th, blowing around five, five to 10 knots from the south-southwest. And on April 10th through 11th, our third transect, the wind had switched to the southeast and increased to 20 knots. So the effects of wind stress are highly visible when you look at the degree of water column mixing in each transect. For example, the following panels show the three cross plume transects with vertical profiles of salinity to illustrate the contrasting plume and shelf layers and degree of wind mixing over time. So on the x-axis is distance along the transect and the y-axis is depth to 20 meters, a reminder that this is a really shallow system. So warmer colors on the plots are higher values while cooler colors are lower values. In the three panels, you can see that the Mobile Bay plume creates a two-layer system on the Alabama continental shelf where low salinity plume water is buoyant and at the surface overlaying the higher salinity continental shelf water. However, there are major differences between each of the three sample transects due to wind forcing modifying the location and mixing of the plume. So on April 9th in panel A, we can, you can see that we sampled a highly stratified water column with a really thin surface plume shown in blue. This first transect was sampled during stable, low wind conditions, and you can see that there is little to no water column mixing. However, the following night of April 9th through 10th, shown in panel B, southwestward winds increased, causing some mixing of the water column and slightly eroding stratification while deepening the halo climb. The following night, on April 10th through 11th, shown in panel C, strong winds blew from the southeast, switching the system to downwelling and mixing the entire water column. I also want to highlight the other distinct differences between the plume and shelf water masses during the study period. For instance, fluorescence, which is shown in the second row of panels here, um, was distinctively higher in plume waters, reflecting the high productivity of the nutrient-rich river water flowing into the Gulf of Mexico. Additionally, turbulence, which is shown in the third row of panels here, was on average at least an order of magnitude higher in the plume than shelf water masses throughout the duration of the study. Turbulence also increased threefold between transect one and transect three due to the strong wind-induced mixing of the plume and water column. So there are two things I want you to take away from the slide. In all three transects, plume waters were characterized by having lower salinity and much higher turbulence and fluorescence than the underlying shelf waters. There is also this trend of increasing turbulence over time as wind mixing increases. So next I wanna highlight a couple of findings from the drifter data. The following map uh, shows the red track lines of six surface configured drifters that were all released from the mouth of Mobile Bay on April 9th at around 1500 in order to track the plumes movements over the following couple of days. There are a couple interesting patterns here I wanna point out. Uh, for one, in low wind conditions on April 9th, the four drifters released from the eastern and central side of the bay showed the plume discharging offshore where it was advected eastward by shelf currents. In contrast, drifters released from the west side of the bay, as you can see on the map, were retained for nearly seven hours in a localized region shown as the yellow shaded oval on the map. This is likely due to the strong physical convergence created by the outflowing plume converging with alongshore currents and ambient shelf waters. Therefore, there appears to be mechanisms for physical retention of water masses and entrained and entrained plankton on the west side of Mobile Bay on April 9th. This is important to note for later when we look at organism distributions. However, I also want to note that on the afternoon of April 10th, the wind shifted direction and began blowing strongly from the southeast at 20 knots. This advected the surface waters inshore against the Alabama coastline as evidenced by the complete reversal in direction of the eastern drifters, which are shown as the dashed red lines on the map. These data highlight multiple dispersal pathways for larval fish and zooplankton in this region via offshore advection with the discharging plume, but also inshore advection due to the strong winds reversing surface waters and pushing them inshore. 
So to see how larval fish has responded to all this physical forcing, we plotted fine scale concentrations of one meter vertically binned larval fishes across the three plume transects. So here I am showing the same salinity depth profiles from earlier, but overlaid with in situ concentrations of fish larvae within the one meter vertical bins, which are shown as the black circles and are scaled by concentration. In the low wind, highly stratified conditions on April 9th, we found a dense aggregation of fish larvae accumulating near the outflow of the Mobile Bay plume at the western end of the transect. This is roughly the same spatial temporal location as the convergent region revealed by the plume tracking drifters I showed on the previous slide. However, as winds increased and there was slight mixing of the water column on April 9th through 10th, the aggregation began to dissipate and fish larvae became more dispersed throughout the transect. And as strong southeast winds mixed the entire water column the following night, fish larvae were observed to become even more dispersed and much less abundant overall, likely due to plume-driven horizontal advection as well as vertical mixing from wind forcing. So we also looked at the fine-scale calanoid copepod distributions, which served as the larval fish prey group across the three transects. In highly stratified plume conditions, Copepods were rather ubiquitously distributed throughout the transect and very abundant. As wind stress and mixing increased, copepods became far less abundant. Siphonophores, which represented one of the predator categories for fish larvae, show a similar distribution to fish larvae as they were also densely aggregated on the western end of the transect and appear to become similarly dispersed and less abundant over time with mixing and advection. Both hydromedusae and tenophores showed similar distributional patterns as the ones described here and are therefore not shown. So Spearman correlation heat maps were used to summarize the more general spatial patterns among different taxa, as well as among the different environmental variables over time. So the darker the color of each box, the stronger the correlation is between the two groups. And blue boxes represent significant positive correlations, while red boxes represent negative significant negative correlations and white boxes represent no correlation between the two groups so i don't have time to go over these in great detail but to examine predator prey relationships across environmental conditions i want to point out the columns highlighted in orange in each transect that show that in the first transect on april 9th on the left side of the um, slide fish larvae were positively spatially correlated with both their prey and predators likely due to plume conditions that facilitate biological aggregation, such as the inherently high productivity of plume water, but also the strong physical convergence near the mouth of the Mobile Bay that appeared to accumulate and retain plankton. As mixing of water, of water masses and turbulence increased in the water column in the second transect, fish became slightly less spatially correlated with their gelatinous predators. And as winds strengthened further in the third transect, the water column was subjected to mixing and highly turbulent conditions, and fish larvae were not sign significantly spatially correlated with either their zooplankton prey or predators. So we observed the distinctive trend that as physical forcing of the system increased, the spatial relationships between organisms fell apart. These patterns suggest that high discharge plumes modified by wind mixing appear to affect the spatial distributions of larval fishes over very short time scales, which could result in altered trophic interactions. Okay, so to determine the impacts of encounter with these dynamic plume processes on larval fish survival, we also towed a multi-net system over the same study period to capture fish larvae from turbulent, low salinity plume water masses. And then we also towed nets to compare fish larvae from ambient shelf water masses for comparison. So the locations and environmental conditions that each net tow sampled are shown in the physical profiles here. So we then examined the two most abundant species captured in the net toes, which were larval striped anchovy shown on the left and larval sand sea trout shown on the right. I've also included pictures of their um, adult stages so you have a better idea what they look like. Um, so both of these are common species that are spawned in the nearshore regions of the Northern Gulf of Mexico from March to April and some larvae enter estuarine systems which provide critical nursery habitat for the larval and juvenile stages. During their larval stages, Major prey items for both species include calanoid copepods. To examine the effects of plume encounter on fish larvae, we compared growth and morphometric condition between larvae captured from these low salinity plume waters, which will be shown in green in the subsequent slides, and high salinity shelf waters, which will be shown in blue from now on. 
So to look at growth of fish larvae, we conducted otolith microstructure analysis for both species. Sagittal otoliths of each species were dissected and read at a thousand times magnification using image processing software. Two metrics were used to analyze growth patterns in each water mass. Mean daily growth, which is shown as the purple line on the otolith, was calculated by average, averaging increment width over each day of life of all individuals. Mean recent growth, which is shown as the red line, was calculated by averaging growth of each individual over the last three full days of life prior to capture. Recent growth was used because exact timing of larval entrainment in each plume water mass is unknown, but this allows us to infer how the different environmental conditions the larvae were experiencing around the time of capture affected their growth rate. So we used linear mixed effects models to test whether mean daily growth differed between plume and shelf captured fish larvae for each of the two species. The model parameters for each species included the fixed effects of age, the water mass they were captured from, either plume or shelf, and an age by water mass interaction term. To account for repeated measures of daily growth of individual fish, the full model included both the random intercept term of fish identity and the random slope term of age for each individual. First order autoregressive correlation terms were also included in all models as a random effect to account for the inherent autocorrelation between measuring sequential otolith increments. Model selection was performed using a backward stepwise approach that successfully removed random and fixed effects, and the final model was selected using AIC and is shown here. So for the results, uh, we found that daily growth varied significantly with age and water mass occupied by the larvae. For both species, uh, linear, these linear mixed effects models indicated that daily growth was initially slightly higher for plume larvae, which are shown in green, than shelf larvae, which are shown in blue. And this was in the early life, but then it reversed around day 20 to 25 for larval anchovy and around day five to six for larval sea trout and began increasing more lap rapidly with age in shelf larvae than plume larvae. So these diverging growth trajectories may be indicative of early encounter with plume water masses for sea trout larvae and later encounter in life for anchovy larvae. However, because the exact timing of larval entrainment within a plume could not be determined, we also examined recent growth during the last three complete days of life prior to capture for all larvae to minimize the potential effects of differential spatial and environmental conditions on early larval growth. Interestingly, we found that mean recent growth over the last three days of life was significantly slower in plume larvae, shown in green, than shelf larvae, shown in blue, for both species. In general, fast-growing fish larvae are of higher condition accumulating more lipids and reaching the minimum condition needed for metamorphosis sooner than their slower growing counterparts. Thus, the slower growing larvae in plume waters were likely more susceptible to predation. By reducing growth and lengthening the duration of the small and vulnerable larval stage, encounter with dynamic plume waters likely confers a survival disadvantage to fish larvae. So we also compared condition of plume and shelf larvae by measuring five to six linear body dimensions, such as head depth, dorsal depth, et cetera, that have been shown to vary with larval feeding success. The body morphometrics were then regressed against length to compare condition of larvae collected from plume and shelf waters. So if fish larvae were skinnier at length, they were likely not feeding as well, suggesting they were in poorer condition. If fish larvae were fatter at length, they were likely feeding better and therefore were in higher condition. So non-metric multidimensional scaling revealed differences in body morphometrics between water masses. As you can see here, for both species of fish, axis one explained most of the variation in body shape and was positively correlated with all body dimensions and therefore served as a suitable proxy for larval body condition. This means if a fish ordinates on the right side of the axis, it is fatter at length and in higher condition overall. When we ran the ordination, we found that plume captured larvae shown as the green triangles generally clustered on the left side of the axis, indicating they were in poor condition or skinnier at length, while shelf-captured larvae, shown as the blue circles, generally clustered on the right side of the axis, indicating they were in higher morphometric condition. So not only were plume-captured larvae generally growing slower, they were also skinnier at length than their shelf conspecifics. So why were plume-captured larvae growing more slowly and in poor condition? We have a couple hypotheses. It could possibly be due to the physiological stress of entrainment within a low salinity water mass. However, experimental studies have shown that both anchovy and sea trout to be highly urihaline and urethermal and generally tolerant to the fluctuating conditions inherent of the coastal systems and estuaries they inhabit as larvae. 
So given this, it is likely that other physical and biological factors are more directly associated with reduced growth and condition. For example, perhaps there were less prey and feeding opportunities for fish larvae in plume water masses. However, when we actually compared calonicopopod biomass in plume versus shelf water masses, we found that there was actually higher concentrations of prey available in the plume water masses across all three transects of our study. Therefore, we think it is most plausible that plume physical properties are disrupting larval feeding success. Our study showed very high levels of turbulence within the plumes as compared with the underlying shelf waters. Experimental studies have shown that very high turbulence decreases larval fish prey capture success. One research group showed that at 10 to the negative two turbulence dissipation rates, herring and cod larvae experienced significant declines in capture success of prey. In comparison, our turbulence dissipation rates within plume waters exceeded these experimental values by a few orders of magnitude. Therefore, it is possible that the high turbulence within plume water may be inhibiting prey contact and decreasing the ability of larval fish to capture prey, which would quickly manifest as slower recent growth and poorer morphometric condition for these larvae. Another hypothesis we have is that although prey are available, fish larvae may be unable to detect them within the plume waters. Side-by-side -side raw ISIS images from the plume and nearby coastal shelf waters show how dark and full of particulates Mobile Bay plume is at the scale of an individual fish larvae. This makes sense when you think of how nutrient-rich plume water is higher in both phytoplankton and sediments. Because fish larvae are visual predators, high turbidity in plumes could be inhibiting their ability to visually detect their prey and may be contributing to the lower growth and condition patterns we observed in this study. So to summarize, larval fish in river-dominated coastal ecosystems experience highly variable physical and trophic environments. The aggregation and retention of planktonic prey in a stratified water column near the Mobile Bay plume suggests that under stable conditions with minimal wind forcing, distribution near a coastal river plume could facilitate enhanced prey contact and thus increase survival of fish larvae. However, our documentation of the spatial separation of fish larvae from their prey with increasing wind stress and turbulence indicates this relationship can really quickly change. Additionally, entrainment within plume water masses appeared to result in larvae growing more slowly and being skinnier at length than their shelf conspecifics, suggesting there are measurable consequences for encounter with high discharge river plumes, especially under high wind stress. Therefore, our results suggest that the environmental conditions inherent of a freshwater influenced coastal regions can indeed enhance larval fish survival via bottom-up processes, but if physical forcing in the system begins to dominate the biological interactions, the habitat can quickly become unfavorable for larval fishes. So future climate projections for the northern Gulf of Mexico are variable and uncertain as of now, but general global patterns portend increases in weather extremes such as heavy precipitation storms, high river discharge events, and increasing wind speeds. The increase in frequency, magnitude, and duration of fresh water delivered to coastal ecosystems could prolong conditions that can negatively impact larval fish survival. So while increased nutrient-rich river discharge would immediately enhance coastal primary pr productivity, highly turbid plume water could impair the ability of fish larvae to forage successfully despite the higher zooplankton biomass accompanying enhanced coastal productivity. Further, increased river discharge and widespread turbulent frontal zones may inhibit prey capture abilities of entrained fish larvae. Ultimately, results of the present study build on our understanding of how increased freshwater discharge in coastal ecosystems worldwide can influence nearshore fish communities at scales relevant to the vulnerable larval stages. All right, so now I'm gonna change gears a bit and give a quick overview on a couple of the research projects I'm involved with for the ECOFOSI group of the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where I'll be studying how different climate-mediated physical processes affect the early life stages of Alaskan and Arctic fishes. So really I'm asking similar research questions as before, but in a different and much colder system. So one major concern and research priority for Alaska Fisheries Science Center is understanding how species distributions may shift in response to increasing sea surface temperatures, since there is the potential for the northward expansion of more southerly distributed species as a consequence of Arctic warming. So some new data I'm beginning to work with is looking at the distributional changes of different larval fish assemblages in the US Arctic from 2010 through 2019. A collaborator on this project, Esther Goldstein from Alaska Fisheries Science Center Age and Growth Group, 
ran a non-metric multidimensional scaling analysis to ordinate larval fish catches per unit effort by warm, cold, and mixed water assemblages. You can see that the warmer water assemblages, shown on red on the left, was comprised of taxa like yellowfin sole, while the colder water assemblages, shown in blue on the right, was comprised of species like arctic cod, and that species such as saffron cod and pollock made up the middle mixed assemblage. The color was based on AXIS-1 scores, and only larvae that made up greater than 2% of the data were used in this analysis. So the distributions of the different larval fish assemblages were then plotted for each year. You can see that in years where there is low summer sea ice and more warm Alaskan coastal water present, like 2010 and 11, also 2017, 18, and 19, that there are more warmer and mixed water species, like yellowfin sole and saffron cod, shown as the red and teal circles dominating the assemblage. So there is this potential trend in warmer water larval fish assemblages distributed further north into habitats historically primarily occupied by cold water assemblages, such as Arctic cod. So we plan to build off of this analysis to assess changes in these assemblages in relation to different environmental drivers, like temperature, ice cover, and then different water masses. But the primary goal of this project is to examine um, community-wide distributional shifts of Arctic larval fish taxa over time. So is there a northward expansion of boreal species and how will this change the ecological interactions experienced by Arctic larval fishes? So this will likely involve comparing centers of distributions of common Arctic species from year to year and possibly some predictive modeling to look at projections of future scenarios with increased temperature and sea ice loss. So another project I'm beginning to work on focuses on Arctic cod, which are one of the most abundant fish in the Arctic Ocean and a key pre prey resource for upper trophic level organisms. Arctic cod are tightly linked to the sea ice habitat with young Arctic cod feeding on the ice on small, um, feeding under the ice on small zooplankton that feed on the ice algae. Therefore, they are especially vulnerable to warming and loss of sea ice which is a real problem as we are seeing sea ice retreat earlier and earlier in the spring with overall less spatial coverage throughout the year. However, the impacts of recent severe shifts in sea ice extent and phenology on larval Arctic cod survival is challenging to predict due to the lack of early life history data on this species. So this project stems from the Arctic Integrated Ecosystem Research Program field efforts, which sampled larval fishes in the North Bering and Chukchi Sea region using bongo nets in June and August and September of 2017 and 18. So when the lab opens up again, hopefully not too far in the future, my collaborator Ali Deary and I plan to conduct a seasonal and interannual comparison of the diet composition and prey selectivity of Arctic cod larvae to examine trophic relationships in relation to sea ice loss and other climate mediated physical processes. Another collaborator on this project, Esther Goldstein, is also working on otolith analyses of some of these fish, which will enable us to back calculate hatch dates and hopefully relate growth to feeding success of Arctic cod early life stages. So ultimately, documenting changes in the distributions, trophic relationships, and survival of the early life stages of marine fishes in response to the, to the environment, regardless of the system, is critical to predicting how future climate scenarios will affect fisheries production worldwide. So that's all I have for the summary of my past and future research. And so with that, I will take any questions if you have any. Keely, thank you so much. Um, I would clap for everybody. So just imagine a very big room or 150 people clapping for you. Um, so I know, weird. Um, okay, so with that, um, I have not seen any questions yet go into the chat. So please, for those who are still on the line, please uh, type your questions into the chat feature so that Jens and I can address those with Keely. So yeah, and Keely, thank you so much for doing this. Um, yeah, of course. Fun introduction to to get to know the work that you've done and that you're going to be doing here with with EcoFoci. So I'm just monitoring. Really, no questions yet. <laughs> we might scapegoat out of this one. <laughs> Well, if people do have questions they want to send later, yeah. um, I put my Thanks. email at the bottom of the slide. So, all right, we got this. Okay, Colleen Petrick, who actually used to work with the folks. See, now everybody's typing questions. Now I won't even be able to go back. <laughs> okay, wait. So Colleen asks, 
Were there more gelatinous zooplankton associated with the higher turbidity waters in the Gulf of Mexico because they are non-visual predators and potential competitors with fish larvae? Yes, that is something that we definitely think is happening. Um, generally, lots of studies have shown that gelatinous zooplankton um, are frequently found aggregating within plume waters, but then also at the frontal edges of the plume waters in those convergent regions. And so that's why we use gelatinous zooplankton as the larval fish predator group um, to focus on because we know that they are um, very abundant in these water masses and um, that they aren't affected by turbidity because they are not visual, visual predators. Um, they're tactile predators. So they are just feeling around. Yeah, so great question. Thank you, Colleen. Um, Stephanie Doner, sorry, Stephanie, if that if I mispronounced your last name, um, has asked, have you compared your field results for Mobile Bay to modeled flow during typical and extreme outflows? That's a good question. Um, so like I said, the typical river discharge from Mobile Bay is 2,200 cubic meters per second. And it, I mean, extreme outflows, I think they've recorded around 12,000 cubic meters per second. We only sampled during a high discharge event, which was 6,000 cubic meters per second. So this is like, what we sampled in was um, higher discharge, but not extremely high discharge. And so it's, it's, the level of discharge is pretty typical for the for this system in spring when there's a lot of rain and we we were happy with that um with our sampling of that because it is they are conditions that occur um, throughout the year so it wasn't on the extreme end but it also wasn't on the low end okay um dave kimmel <laughs> Um, has asked, most of your work in the Gulf of Mexico occurred in the spring prior to hypoxia setting up. Oops, of course I just scrolled past it. Um, but could you comment on how hypoxia might impact your findings? Yes, um, hypoxia, so yeah, as, as more nutrient-rich river discharge comes into the region and the water temperature is warm and there's stratification, hypoxia can set in. And it would be really, so we actually did do summer sampling um, during hypoxic regions. And I'll actually point you to um, Adam Greer has a paper out that discusses some of those hypoxia findings where he did look at larval fish and zooplankton distributions throughout hypoxic regions. And um, I believe he found that there was some um, that there was some potential behavioral avoidance of these hypoxic regions by larval fish, but not so much of gelatinous zooplankton, which again, um, seem to be pretty highly tolerant of a lot of different conditions, including low oxygen. Um, so again, the data are there to be analyzed someday in the future, perhaps. But um, I think that there would be some spatial avoidance of hypoxic zones by um, organisms that are more sensitive to lower oxygen conditions. Thanks, Keely. Um, OK, let's see. Valerie, well, I should first say Natasha Hardy, who was on, she just said comment mainly. She said this was awesome. <laughs> um, and it was, I agree, Natasha. Let's see. Okay. And Valerie Brady, um, the ISA sounds pretty awesome. Could a device work? Could such a device work in the Great Lakes? <laughs> Hi, Val. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. I, I think it would, but I also think that you would have to have a lot of large hard drives because um, there is a lot less plankton in the Great Lakes. And so that would be a lot of video footage that you would ha you'd have to tow for a very long time um, to be able to collect you know, substantial data. But I do think that the Great Lakes are very oligotrophic. Or spent, well, Lake Superior, I'm thinking of in particular. And so it would the images would be pretty high quality because the visibility is a lot better in the in Lake Superior. Lake Michigan would be a different story in Lake Erie, but um, yeah, that, I think it's possible. <laughs> um, and let's see, uh, Jerry Wersma uh, said, it's a long question, so bear with me. Okay, I think it's multiple questions here, so I'm just gonna ask it once. How do you 
how do you measure the difference between shelf and plume fish larvae? In other words, how do you distinguish the larvae affected by plumes and living away from the plume? It was not really clear in the method. I hope my question is not too confusing. Um, and then also, do you have a recommendation to reduce the plumes into the river? And will the reduction be likely to increase the survival rate of fish larvae? Um, for the first question, so we sampled, we towed nets um, within plume water masses, which you can visually see because of the turbidity difference from the surface. The water is like greener and browner. Um, but we also had a CTD mounted on our net systems. And so while we were towing the nets, we knew exactly where, like that we were in a low salinity water mass. Um, and the shelf stations that we, the, the shelf station that we sampled, we knew was a high salinity water mass um, outside of the plume because we had um, a CTD again and we were um, tracking the salinity. So we knew that these fish, the fish larvae that we collected, so at the time of capture, these fish larvae were either entrained within a plume or in surrounding shelf waters. Um, for your second question as to how to um, reduce the amount of river discharge, there's not really a great way because obviously with increasingly heavy precipitation storms, there's in the Midwest, there's just more water that's coming down into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and again, you know, freshwater influence in coastal regions has generally been shown to increase coastal productivity and pro potentially provide a better feeding environment for fish larvae. But if there's so much that the the zooplankton or the um, the phytoplankton blooms are enormous and reducing turbidity, but then also I didn't talk about this, but they can cause harm, sorry harmful algal blooms, which can also kill marine organisms and cause stress on local fisheries. That's also a really big issue. So unfortunately, there's no there's no easy fix there. Okay, let's see. Thank you, Keely. That was um, oh, injury just followed. Yes, the turbidity and nutrient outwash is more of the problem than the salinity drop. Just a comment by him as, or them as well. Mm -hmm. um, Terrence Wang also um, added, let's see, though fish larvae predators may be more tactile feeders, are they still negatively impacted by the turbid waters because their prey are less concentrated and well fed? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I guess I would think that they would, their prey might be more concentrated within these plume water masses. Um, as we saw, like for example, Kalanite copepods were in higher abundances um, within the plume waters than the surrounding waters. And again, that's probably because of physical convergence, um, retaining and accumulating plankton in that region, but then also the higher primary productivity, which um, can increase the general zooplankton biomass. So I actually think that the, Feeding, there's more prey for gelatinous zooplankton within plumes, um, but again, them being tactile predators, they probably aren't um, affected by turbidity as much as visual predators like larval fishes are. Thank you, Keely. Um, all right, that is the last of the questions I have right now. So this is the last call for questions. And while I give that a minute, um, just remember that we do have one more EcoFoci seminar for the series, and that is next week. Um, the seminar is listed on the One NOAA Science Seminar series. And then again, you can also find details through the NOAA Pacific Marine Environmental Lab calendar of events um, listed there. And of course, if you guys have, if anybody has follow up questions, uh, please message myself or Jens. We are listed as the point of contacts. And then also we did record the seminar today. So um, there's a lot of folks who couldn't join in. So we'll be sending this out and making it available for a period of time. So if you know anybody who will be looking for that as well, please um, just have the message both Jens and I. Uh, Keely, there's no more questions. So I think with that, just one last thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I think we'll conclude the seminar. Great, thank you for having me. All right. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day and uh, stay healthy and, and sane out there. Okay. And we'll see you all back here next week.